We're going to continue on in our study on six things that the Lord doth hate. Six things that the Lord doth hate. The text is, uh, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and next is hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, you can go to Exodus 23 if you will. Uh, the Bible reads in Exodus 20 verse 13, that very famous uh, Ten Commandments. It says, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Those four words in the commandments just there, standing out very firm, very pointed. Thou shalt not kill. And we'll take these verses often, this verse in particular, and apply that across the board. And then people will say, well, there's so much killing in the Bible that was commanded of the Lord and commanded of the Lord and people have done. And, and therefore, uh, this is a contradiction in the Bible. Is, is it never that we should kill? Um, well, the Bible records in Exodus 23 and verse 7, it says, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. So the wicked here is in the context, the one that slays the innocent, the one that slays the righteous. And as you're reading through even from where I just started in Exodus 20 up to Exodus chapter 23, you'll find many judicial, relational, criminal, ceremonial laws and ordinances dealing specifically with the people of Israel. Um, many of them have the tag on the end of it, um, shall be put to death. This is commanded against, whosoever committeth shall be put to death. So how do you rationalize thou shalt not kill with putting people to death? Well, Jesus made it clear in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 18 when he reaffirmed the commandments <clears throat> as he was trying to convince one, that he can keep the law and therefore get into heaven. And he listed a whole bunch of them. And in there, he reiterated, thou shalt not kill as thou shalt do no murder. So we see then there's a difference between the ceremonial application of a law given by God in the judicial, relational, criminal, ceremonial laws that he had instituted. There's a difference between that and murdering. Many such guilty crimes, crimes that someone would be guilty of, constitute the death penalty, murder being one of them, cursing parents, kidnapping, adultery, sodomy, bestiality. These corporal punishments, I believe, are right and just. According to my faith in the scriptures, those still stand, many of them. And murder is not just one of them that is somehow worse than the other, though it is punishable by death. And hands that shed innocent blood would fall into the category of murder, murderers. These days, we find that most of these laws uh, that had corporal punishment associated with them in the Old Testament, some being adultery, sodomy, kidnapping, cursing parents, are met not with the death penalty, but today there will be perhaps some jail time, uh, perhaps some fines, or perhaps nothing at all. Maybe a slap on the wrist is what someone would get for committing these crimes. And that's wicked. That's wrong. I believe still, according to the Bible, in the areas of judicial law, that murder should be the death penalty. Kidnapping should be the death penalty. Adultery should be the death penalty. Sodomy, bestiality, death penalty, punishable by death. And the best thing about instituting these types of laws, someone will say, cursing your parents, I mean, kids curse their parents all the time. If we lived in a righteous government whereby cursing your parents put one child to death, many other children would have a different outlook upon cursing their own parents. And this wouldn't be this thing where we're just like, well, every kid does, and we'd be putting all the kids to death. Now, it would pretty much take one, and therefore, you would see that story told, you would see that published, far and wide, and kids would have a righteous attitude towards their parents and would not be cursing them. The law is clear, the law is right, and the law is just. The law of the Lord is pure, it is clean, it is good, it is righteous, and I am for the government abiding by it and punishing evildoers according to it. That is their jurisdiction, according to the scriptures, to take the law and apply it, including all of the death penalty statutes and judgments associated with it. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. <clears throat> to the right in your Bible, you're going to find the book of Leviticus. 
Leviticus chapter 18, we find some dire warnings and consequences given to the nation that does such abominations which the Lord hates and does nothing to stop it. Leviticus 18 and verse 24, the Bible reads, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. That the land spew not you out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations which were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the soul that committeth them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinances, that ye commit not any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. Amen and amen. Amen. The, the charge there is given very clearly that the land, the, the dirt, the earth, the space that we inhabit these days and other nations inhabit throughout history, ha the land has literally vomited out. What a, what a great way of picturing how a people is removed from a land for committing abomination. The land is so abhorred and disgusted by the acts that are being discussed here that it vomiteth out the inhabitants, removes them from the face of the earth. We don't need to get too much further into the visual of what this all means. But this is how God puts it. He says, keep my commandments, keep my statutes, don't do like the people before you, and thereby suffer the same fate as they have, where they're expelled from the land as an upchuck, as a, as a throw up, as a vomit. It's just something so disgusting it has to be removed. And all that's listed here in Leviticus chapter 18, many of you know very well, are crimes of passion. We have many sexual, sensual, carnal, perverted things listed among them and tucked away within this is this interesting verse number 21. It says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. There was a name given unto the God that these People were passing their children, passing their seed through the fire unto. They were offering an homage in, in, in sacrifice unto this God, lowercase g, Moloch. And it is no coincidence that it is then loop, grouped in with the sins that we see listed here. We find sodomy, we find incest, we find uh, people going in unto beasts. We find all sorts of disgusting things that are abomination, confusion, wicked, filthy things. Hey, that many people do today. It's a shame to speak of those things which are done in secret, but God here outlines them very clearly. And, and today is no different. These things are done. These things are same as they were yesterday, is the same as they are today. And then nestled into this, we find this offering things in sacrifice unto Moloch. And there's no coincidence today, because today, Moloch represents that same God of convenience that walks hand in hand with each one of these sensual, lustful, disgusting desires and sins and wickedness that people fall through. Moloch is still being sacrificed unto today. Let's learn more about him. Leviticus chapter 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel. I love how God is always clear to say that, yeah, you can welcome strangers in. They're to abide by the same law. So in the same way, hey, if we're living on a land that abide unto that law, wouldn't you think that we would be strangers and foreigners in it? If you go back a few generations, many of our family is settlers in this area. The law of the Lord still apply in this land. Therefore, as sojourners, we ought to abide by that same law. I'll continue. That giveth, so any of the strangers that shall journey in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. 
And if the people of the land do in any ways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Moloch and kill him not, they're covering for his sins. Now they're just pretending it didn't happen. Whatever happens in darkness, whatever happens on Church Street, we'll just ignore it, right? We'll just try to turn a blind eye from it, is what's being talked about here. And if the people of the land do that and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off. And all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Moloch from among their people. We see then that the filth of the hands for the act is applied for even ignoring. Choose to willfully ignore what's going on. Willingly just kind of, oh, you know, that's what they're doing, those Moloch worshipers. So the sin here that we see is giving seed unto, going a whoring after, committing whoredoms with Moloch. And who is Moloch, some might ask. Moloch, you'll see him in pictures quite often, is just this giant devil. Of course, many of them are statues. But the Bible is clear that the things that the Gentiles sacrifice unto, the idols that they sacrifice unto, they sacrifice not to the, the wood, to the stone, to the metal that they've graven it out to. There's an actually a devil associated with them that is giving power unto the sacrifice that is being made. And Moloch was no different. He is a devil as real as any other devil that currently abides here. And his likeness back in the time of Israel was of this giant calf with his hands outstretched and the hand was outstretched with a belly of fire within the middle and it would accept sacrifices of young children as they put them on the brazen altar of the hands and they moved down into the belly into the fire passing the seed unto Moloch and we're all like oh god gross disgusting and horrible that's awful but today I will tell you it is no different that same Moloch is being offered unto just today we have a more clinical way of doing it Today we have a more clean way of doing it. We do it behind closed doors. We do it, even in most cases, within the womb of a mother. The safest place that a baby ought to be. Yeah, it seems so barbaric that people would not want a child and therefore take that child and place it upon an altar to burn it to death. That seems so strange and foreign to us. And yet that same God of convenience exists today and it's in the abortion clinics that line our streets in this city, that line our streets in this nation, that line our streets in this world. That same sin is being committed to the God of convenience. They're offering their children, but it's clinical now, right? It's doctor sanctioned. It's, it's government approved. Everyone says it's okay because it's the mother's choice, but the same thing is happening. And instead of that innocent child being offered up and dropped into a fire, that same innocent child is sacrificed within the womb of the mother. And it's, it's more clean, right? It's clinical. It's a doctor thing. No, it's wicked. It's disgusting, it's filthy, and it's the same as it was back then. Oh, but wait, we, we've, we've come further than that, right? We're not even now allowing for that only to be carried out within the safety of the mother's womb. Just as it was in the day when the child would be birthed, then sacrificed, hey, we're just like one pinky finger away from it. Isn't the law such now that the baby can be born? As long as some of it is in the womb, we consider it not burned, born yet. We consider it not a child yet. We consider it not a real human being. No longer can they use that argument that, oh, it's just a clump of cells. No longer can they use that argument that it's, it's not a child yet. It can't live on its own. We let the baby be pretty much born before they're offering it to that same God, Moloch. It's wicked and it's, it's disgusting. And to the tune of 200 plus per day, Children, Canadian children are being destroyed in that fashion. Canadian children are being murdered in that fashion. I've been back and forth about whether or not to even talk about this thing because the topic is so disgusting and disturbing. When you think about our son being born early and it is, it, it is legal, our son being premature and it is legal to murder him. It is completely okay to take devices move within that safety of the mother's womb at a time when we were begging that the Lord would give him one more week to stay within there so that he could be healthy enough that his lungs would work correctly that he would be able to breathe and live and be a normal child and live a normal life in that time when we were praying for that across the hall there were babies the same age being killed it's disgusting That's right. this nation is full of wickedness and abominations and it starts with the blood guiltiness that's on our hands. It's just the fruit of it. It's just the beginning of it. This is 
the root of the problem that we have here in Canada and in the world. I cannot even, I can't, I can't even talk. It's, it's so disturbing to think that these things happen. Right. And when people find out about this stuff actually happening, they're just as this. They're imagine young children. Imagine, imagine the, I mean, there's young children here, and, and it's good that they hear some of this stuff. But I have to keep it at a level that is acceptable to their ears. Because the filth that happens behind closed doors is just... It's, it's, it's abominable. I've seen it as, as New York announced what it was. People started to make these things aware. And most of the world just could care less. It's still just the same type of sacrifice as it was in the womb as it is now. And we're getting closer and closer and closer today. How long is it going to be until we literally erect a statue of Moloch and just say, Come on, come on, come all. We don't need to do it behind closed doors anymore. It's acceptable. It's good and right. Hey, he's five years old. Get him in there. Right? Step by step by step by step, this is the wickedness that is coming over our nation. And we're guilty. Us two today, we have guilty hands. The, the problem with blood guiltiness is that it flows into land. Do you remember the story of Abel? Do you remember that when Abel was murdered by Cain, his blood went into the ground and that blood still cried out unto the Lord? That blood still testified of a life lost. That blood still exposed the murderer for who he was, crying out to God. Even so today, that same thing is happening. And by association, murder is something that you can be guilty of. There's many examples. The Jews the Bible records, both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. And yet we read in the scriptures how they offered Jesus unto the Romans who actually committed the deed. And yet the Bible records that the Jews killed them. David, from the comfort of his own kingdom, from his own castle, sent out that Uriah the Hittite would go to the heat of the battle and be destroyed there to cover up his own sins that he had taken place while his faithful man was off at war. And the Bible records that David was the man, the prophet proclaiming, Thou art the man who has taken of that ewe lamb and, and, and ripped it out of the hand of the rightful owner. Herod beheaded John. But he didn't do it himself. He didn't go down into the dungeon, though many times he's been down there to enjoy the preaching of the word, to enjoy the voice of the prophet, to have fellowship with the prophet. When it came time to remove John's head because of, because of the oath that he had made, he sent for it to be done and the head be brought in a charge. And yet the Bible records that Herod was the murderer of John the Baptist, though his hands never touched the tool. His hands never brazed the neck. His hands never had a speck of blood upon them, but what happens? The blood crieth from the land, and it tells of things greater than that of Abel. The blood cries from the land, and it proclaims the truth of what had happened that day. In the same way in our nation, the blood cries out from the, from the earth beneath these, these hospitals, these clinics, these, these right. places of human ritual, filthy sacrifice. And it's expressing that this nation is wicked, this nation has forgotten God, and this nation will never again be what it once was. It will never have God turn away that judgment. We're, we're done. This whole world's going to face that same condemnation because the last few places of this earth that are even standing upon righteousness are, are some of the most filthy places you've ever seen. This whole world's becoming as Sodom. This whole world's becoming as Gomorrah. And God is just and righteous to judge and condemn it as such. We as Christians have the same blood guiltiness upon our hands. How do we apply that same, how is that blood applied to us? There are many different ways that I've looked at as I meditated upon these things and it was awful to do so. We don't, as we should, expose this wickedness. We don't raise our voice when people talk openly about this stuff. We don't proclaim what is right. As children of the light, we need to walk into darkness and have the light be expelled. So when you hear people boasting of their abominations, when you hear people excited about their fornications, about their adulteries, about their murders, about all the things that people do night in and night out, week in and weekend out in their own personal lives, we are not bold enough to expose it for what it is. And Christians need to do that, lest our hands be covered in the same blood. The Apostle Paul went into nations and he said, My hands are clean from the blood of innocent people, because he ceased not, as much as in him was, to preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, exposing darkness, rebuking falsehood, and doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. We have a great power, and it's not in our word, it's in the word of God. 
How often do you just need to say something like, thou shalt not kill? Four words interceded into the conversation at the opportune time can cut like a dagger. Number two, many Christians use contraceptives. Many Christians today use birth control. And what, it's, what it, that actually means is exactly what it says. It's birth control. You notice you've never heard of conception control? You've never heard of that. It's birth control. And what it does, and what many of them do, is they are abortifactor in nature. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. But they actually make the womb into such a hostile environment whereby conception will take place. And do we all believe that conception is when, is when a child is born? That's, yeah, that's the amen. time when a life comes to be. That's the time when God knew him in his mother's womb before he was born. The Bible says about Jeremiah. And that is the exact moment that it happens. And what happens from there? That birth control prevents that life from finding fertile ground within the womb of the mother and planting itself whereby it can be nourished by its mother and continue to grow within the mother until the time it is ready to be birthed and ready to be born unto this world. And many Christians ignorantly, with blood upon their hands, hey, if you're ignorant to these things, that's fine. Get it right now. Many Christians ignorantly continue to use these things and they are aborting, who knows? Once a month, an, an egg is, is dropped. Once a month, a, a child is able to be born. And when you're using the pill in order to stop that child that is conceived from planting, from flourishing, from growing, how many abortions do you think the average woman that takes five years worth of maybe the beginning of their marriage, because a lot of people say, oh, we should plan for these children. So when you first get married, the best thing you can do, I've heard preachers say this, the best thing we can do is to just be on birth control. The right thing to do is to save up your money, buy a house, do all these things. Don't think about children when you first start marrying. So a lot of even, even independent Baptist Bible colleges are recommending this to the women. And what happens is that they, they spend those first five years and ignorantly to themselves, they continue because they're married to engage in the proper relations that a man and woman could, but they're having abortions. Just children are dying within their womb. One, two, three, how many a year? Who knows how many? We need to be aware of these things. And this isn't just the plan B that I'm talking about. This isn't just that one that, that people use after they go out and they party and they make some stupid mistakes and then they just want to destroy the evidence of it the next day. No, this is every one of them. Literally, if you just read the package, that big long thing that they don't expect anyone to read on the birth control packages, ladies, that thing is, it outlines this. I'm not just making this up. The next way that Christians have bloody hands in this regard, hands that shed innocent blood is vaccines. We talked about this a little bit uh, a few weeks ago. I'm not going to go too far into this. But many of these vaccines need to be cultured upon like cells, upon likeness of, of the eventual host of them. Uh, that means that they are taking the tissues from the aborted feces, feces, fe uh, aborted fetuses, aborted babies, aborted children, and they're using them in order to cultivate, in order to produce, in order to grow the microbes that will become the vaccines that you eventually take. And many Christians are pro-vaccine. I see it all the time. They're encouraging people. And even doctors are encouraging the leaders. It's your responsibility. You need to, for the sake of your flock, go and get your shot. Get your flu shot. Get your vaccine. Get your half. Get all these shots put into you. And they are, again, perhaps ignorantly taking these things upon them because all oh, pharmacies tell. Because the doctors say so. Because it's what is right. It's what is. I'm just protecting other people. Not knowing that the uncleanness is. It's, it goes beyond just the beast that they culture this stuff on. It goes beyond just the disgusting chemicals that they use that are poisonous and wicked and disgusting, like aluminum and pumping these things. It goes far beyond that to the fact that they are making most of these drugs, most of these diseases that they put into in small or, or unstable uh, versions or whatever they do, they're culturing them off of abortions. They're culturing off of dead children. And so in this way, the, the Planned Parenthood or, the, or the, the hospital works hand in hand with Big Pharma because the more vaccines they need, and aren't they pushing them a lot right now, get your shot, get your shot, get your shot, get your shot, free flu shots here, free flu shots here. Those need to be created with something. So as the need increases for the, the pharmaceuticals, so the need increases for the tissues that they need of destroyed children in order to make them. And the final way that Christians have their hands unclean and filthy is because we dwell in the land. Simply by association, we dwell 
in this unclean land. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. The last place I go, I think. Deuteronomy chapter 21. And beginning in verse 9. Deuteronomy 21 and verse 1. It says, If one be found slain in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. You can probably underline one there. It's really important. If one be found slain in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him, then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about them that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city shall take an heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto the rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. For them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him. So the, the religious leaders here come forth. And to bless in the name of the Lord, which is their calling. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. The preachers, the men of God, the Levites are to come and they are to observe. The scribes, the, 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 the ones that know the law the greatest. The ones who are esteemed within the ranks of God's order. And all the elders of that city, so then again the esteemed of all men within that city, that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley, and they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. And I can say that today too about the abortions going on up the street, right? Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed. And lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge. And the blood shall be forgiven them. So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, and thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. And so here when one was found... When one man was found within the wilderness, when one man was found destroyed, the nation was to gather together, such were in proximity. The elders of the leadership within that city, the elders of the priests and the Levites were to descend on that place, were to diligently try every stroke in controversy. They were to feel out, hear stories, ask who he was, ask what he was. They were to know the very name of the victim. They were to know what his story was, what had happened to him, what led up to this scenario, where, where did he come from, what happened to him, how was he destroyed, find out every stroke and every controversy. And when all that was said and done, and they could not find who would be put to death, who would be destroyed, who would have the blood put upon their hands in a fashion that they would do in unity, they would wash their hands over top of a slain beast, over top of an animal who had died in the place of the guilty party, they were to slay that one as if he were guilty, having his blood spilled upon the ground, that beast, and they were to, and, and most of these murderers are beasts, most of these, those, these doctors committing this junk are beasts, That's right, right? right? So in the likeness, we slay its throat and it lays on the ground, right? They're to wash their hands over top of it and say, our, blood, our hands did not shed this blood. God, be, be merciful unto us. We, we've, we've sought diligently to find the root cause of this one's life. We tried to find who is the rightful beast that committed this murder. And yet all we have is, is this animal to slay. God, please cleanse us from this blood. And it says, it shall be forgiven him. Now, do you think this happens 200 times a day? Do you think this happens 100,000 times a year? Absolutely not. We've fallen behind on asking God to forgive our land, asking God to forgive and cleanse these hands that have known, perhaps not, not visual, perhaps not seeing it in action, perhaps not witnessing the crime, but we have known that there was crime committed. We have known that there's a death. And we don't even do the justice of knowing the names of the countless unnamed that will be numbered in heaven. We'll see them one day. We don't know, and yet we're so falling so far behind what God actually allowed for. The provision to clean the land, to cleanse the land, was to simply say, God, we don't know what happened. We know there was a death. Forgive us. 
And the Bible records that God would be faithful to do so, but we have not done it a hundred thousand times. The countless blood, the countless amounts of blood of innocence that is upon our land, upon our hands, will never be atoned for. It'll never be removed. The blood guiltiness has seeped into the core. This land is filthy. This land is disgusting. This land, unfortunately, was made for you and me, and we've ruined it. And what's going to be the end of that? Well, I don't think 2 Corinthians 7, 14 is going to do it. Go, go with me to that verse, 2 Corinthians. Because this is what the Baptists will say. This is what the, the Presbyterians will say. This is what most Christians will say. They'll, they'll have these big events, and they'll all come together, and they'll say, this is a missions conference. Let's save our land, Lord. Let's pray for revival. They'll go to the, a chapter like 2 Chronicles, and they'll look at verse 7. 2 Chronicles, I'm sorry, I think I said Corinthians. 2 Chronicles in verse 7, they'll say, If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. I don't even think we've experienced this yet. Things are just good here, and this is why everyone's so complacent. But this is what, this is what many Christians will say, and I just think it won't be good enough. It won't do. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people... The believers, the saved. If my people, the Christians, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. See, all we have to do is humble ourselves, come before God. We need to seek his face. We need to turn from our own wicked ways. And God promised he would heal our land. It's too little too late. We should have been doing this from the moment we found this filth was happening. We should have been doing this from the second the first innocent blood was built upon our nation. And yet, day after day, 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 by the time we meet back here on Sunday, Canadian citizens will be dead. These six things doth the Lord hate. Hands that shed innocent blood being one of them. I don't pray for our nation anymore. I pray for our people. I pray for God's people. I pray that we would get it right. That we would do right. That we would live righteously. That we would set up a new standard. Amen. The nation's done. It's just a matter of time. But we too have these ways that we can look into our own lives. Hey, hey, are we complacent? Are we not speaking the truth? Hey, are we using contraceptives? Do we know people that are? Hey, hey, are there, are there vaccines running through our veins? Are we, are we import, uh, in, encouraging that mentality? And, and by guiltiness, are we not just simply saying, God, help us to do it right. Help us as Christians. Help us as believers to do it right. We know the nation is lost. And praying and seeking after God because of blood guiltiness that relates to us simply because of where we dwell. There's ways that Christians can cleanse our hands. There's ways that Christians can do it right from this day on. I think it's best that we do so. These six things that the Lord hates. Hands that shed innocent blood, and I hate it too. 